Hello, everyone. I'm going to pull up my screen. As I pull up my screen, I just want to say um, I'm just really excited to see um, see everyone popping into the the um, in the call and to see all the, um, the the school districts and things that are represented. I wanted to just say a really special hello. I was surprised to see my PhD advisor pop into the um, into the call this morning. So I wanted or this afternoon. So I wanted to say hi to her, Dr. Janet Kalidner. She is foundational to um, a lot of the work that you'll see here. Um, this really having taught me um, the the ropes of doing research and, and doing this type of work. So um, hi, Janet. Um, I um, want to get started. So the title of my talk today is um, Leveraging the Village for Real World Community Science Learning. Um, and what I hope to do uh, today is to um, inspire you to think of new ways that you can engage um, the broader community um, in your local neighborhoods um, in supporting youth learning in your school districts. Um, so one of the um, key sort of uh, approaches that I take um, to doing community work and, and um, particularly leveraging the community to support to support learning is taking um, an approach called asset-based community development. And so what, what, what asset-based community development does, or ADCD um, for short, um, what it says is that, you know, oftentimes when we start working with communities, especially communities that are uh, minoritized and um, resource constrained, we often tend to think of um, think of working with these communities from a deficit perspective, what they don't have or what they or what they need. But ABCD actually implores us to recognize that all communities have ri really rich assets um, that can be leveraged to um, to promote learning and that everyone and a community has something to contribute. And so then the goal is um, thinking about how can we leverage these, these strengths or these assets um, then to bring people together um, to really uh, build capacity um, and to, in, in my work, I think about how we can do this to promote learning. So I wanna share um, with you a story about how this has worked in one longstanding research project um, that I've worked on for the past um, seven, seven years um, or, or so um, called Science Everywhere. Um, so Science Everywhere is an NSF um, uh, research project that was funded, um, or it was funded by the NSF. And um, what we were doing was trying to um, figure out how we could help uh, learners, particularly those in resource constrained, minoritized communities, to capture and share the science that they were doing across the, the context of their lives. So as they moved from home to school and to after school settings. And so what we did was we designed a set of life relevant learning programs that were situated in two local communities. One was in um, here in on the East Coast and the one was on the West Coast. Um, so we designed these, these uh, life relevant learning programs where kids learn science through everyday life context like cooking or playing games and things like that. Um, and then we designed um, a set of technologies that help the learners to capture and share these experiences with the community. So we designed a social media app that where the kids could take photos and they could um, post those photos and things like that um, on a, on a uh, social news feed. But they could also post them on these large displays that were situated throughout the community context. So at the local after school centers the children participated in um, and at the local schools that they attended. Um, and so with this work, our initial focus and just the, the proposal that we wrote and our initial um, research goals and things like that, we're really focused on how can we understand how kids are developing scientific dispositions um, as they, you know, engage in these community experiences. But what we found towards the end of the project, after about maybe um, five years or so, was that as we talked to parents, as we talked to the adults in the community, they often started to, and we asked them, you know, well, how are your kids developing dispositions in this um, in this setting? They would often actually start thinking about themselves, and they would say, you know what, it's really been changing how I think about science, um, you know, in my life. And so this, we saw this as we talked to parents, as we saw as we talked to teachers who worked with us in the in the program, and as we talked to community volunteers. So we set out to really understand that. So we um, did semi-structured interviews with um, these adults who participated in, um, in the community to really understand how they began to think about science different through their experiences and then how that shaped um, community learning. So what we found was that as we um, as we analyzed the um, the data from um, from these this broad array of adults, we found that they um, that there were two particular themes of, um, of in terms of dispositions that adults sort of brought into or developed um, 
in uh, in the program. Now, not everyone fit into these things, but there were the vast majority of, of participants did. And these were um, some participants fell into the category of communitizers, and then others were more traditional scientists. And so what I want to do is kind of tell you a story about two of those participants, um, Pastor Taylor and Norman, to show you how their how their work in the community began to sort of came come together to promote new experiences in the community. So um, first here is Pastor Taylor. Pastor Taylor is a pastor at uh, Grace Covenant Church and he'd been a pastor for over 15 or so years. He started partnering with us before the project began as even as we were writing the proposal and he, and he partners with us continuing to this day. Um, he was motivated to work with us in this program by um, the opportunity to build new relationships in the community with researchers um, that, uh, you know, from the University of Maryland and with youth in the, um, in the community. And um, when we when we interviewed him the first time about a year into the program, um, Pastor Taylor was actually we talked to him about how he thought about science. He actually was expressing sort of a more distanced perspective of science. So he said, you know, the greatest challenge of participating in science everywhere will probably be my own lack of confidence in those areas of science. You know, I understand that's not my lane. So it's not like I care, <laughs> to be honest. And so I excel in the community part. That's what I bring. But in that same interview, researchers asked him how he um, how he participated, how he made posts or contributed to the Science Everywhere app and community displays. And he said, you know what, I really haven't made any posts or anything like that. And he thought about it. And he said, no, I did take this nice photo, though, when we had to shovel some snow. And he said, you know, my son and I were finished and there was this nice sunset. And he said, you know, I wish I could have posted it and I probably still can. But he said, you know, I don't really think I know. I, I didn't really know what I would say about how would I connect that back to science? And so the researcher said, well, you know, you could ask a question like, you know, why does the sky change color when we have a sunset or something like that? And she said, you know what, you have to scientize the experience, Pastor Taylor. And so he thought about it and he said, you know what, that's true. I could have asked, you know, the, a, another question or why does, how long does the snow take to melt or something like that? And he said, so I will try to scientize. So um, by the second time we, um, we interviewed him about a year later, a year after that, um, Pastor Taylor was actually continuing um, along these lines of, to negotiate his own connection to science. So he was actually seeing the large displays situated at the church where the kids did after school programs. And he was excited about seeing all the activity around the display, the community gathering around it. But he was also really excited to see how the display was being used to showcase a lot of community events that maybe hadn't thought about as being connected to science, but he could begin to see how even those events and the activities that the kids were engaging in were connected to science. But he still didn't see it as relating to his goals. So he said, you know what, I'm sorry, science everywhere. Like, I'm not going to be interested in science. You know, like, it has to be something that's a very specific, like part of my goals. You know, he said, um, you know, and then he didn't really see it. But what he did do um, uh, was he began to think about like, you know, it has to be something that's connected to my goals, like, you know, this, these environmental tests that the kids just did, and he started referring to those, um, to those tests. And so the kids had actually a few months before that been doing some investigations of the water quality in the stream that ran behind the church. And so they did these investigations and they found that, you know what, the water quality is not so good, Pastor Taylor. And so they actually suggested some management practices and installations um, like rain gardens and things like that, that he could do or that the church could do to improve the water quality. And so when we asked Pastor Taylor later, you know what, like how, what's the way that, you know, the community that we as a community can be a, a um, you know, a blessing to the church? Like, how can we contribute back to you? Thinking that maybe he taught, he suggests a church cleanup or, you know, something like that. But he said, you know, what if y'all, what if we, you know, did something with these management practices that the kids suggested so that we could get this water quality uh, issue uh, worked on? And so um, by summer 2018, we actually began to work on that. So we worked together. We partnered with a landscape architect at a local watershed um, society. And we had the kids and the um, Science Everywhere program actually work together to co-design um, the rain garden um, and what, where it would be placed so that it would have the most effective, uh, have the most effect, what plants to plant and things like that. But um, we also like um, uh, began to bring the, the community together around this. So the Science Everywhere Youth and the Watershed Society people came together and Pastor Taylor actually involved lo local high school volunteers from the neighboring high school. He got church members together and had them come together and learn about rain gardens, what they are, how you manage them. And um, he actually had everyone come together to install the rain garden. And so what he was doing then, was, what we see this is an example of communitizing science. So on the other hand, we have Norman. 
Um, Norman was a more traditional scientist. So he was a member of Grace Covenant Church and a PhD student in aerospace engineering at the local university. Um, Norman had been a volunteer at some of the church's other um, after school programs that were more focused on, um, on, on uh, helping kids with their homework. And um, he actually participated as a facilitator um, for three years in Science Everywhere until he finished his PhD. So Norman's motivation in working with us was that he really wanted to improve STEM education. Um, so he wanted to help kids see that science you know, could be fun. And in his first interview about a year into um, the program, he was kind of having some challenges um, engaging some of the kids. So he often was placed with some of the younger boys and they were more playful and rambunctious. And he was thinking like, it's hard to really get them to um, engage in, in science. But he was beginning to recognize the importance of building these relationships with him over the course of multiple sort of programs at, um, at the church. And he was seeing how that could actually have an impact on helping them to engage in science. And so he said, you know, I think the kids have definitely begun to um, buy into actually doing um, the projects. And so um, he was he actually began to refer back to an activity that they had just done in the previous semester where Norman had brought in his research, he brought in some dragonflies that he investigates for aerospace engineering. And then the researchers had designed um, a set of um, activities around designing airplanes around his research. So the kids were designing their own paper airplanes and they were testing them out. And Norman was a facilitator of their the test out their airplanes. And so he was actually observing the types of, um, of uh, observations um, that the kids were making as they were doing their, um, as they were testing out their paper airplanes. And so he was saying, you know what, I really see that they're beginning to buy into this. I think if I, if we didn't have, you know, if we wouldn't have um, uh, placed a priority on those relationships first, then I don't think they would have bought in the same way. But he also began to think about ways that we could better engage the kids. And so he was recognizing based on their interests, if we really want to help them to engage, then we need to help them build something that can solve a particular problem. And he actually suggested that we think about more environmental related things like erosion or something that's really locally related to the place and the, and the community. And that was actually how we designed those environmental investigations that, um, that, that we did that led to the design of the rain garden. And so by the second um, by the second interview that we did with Norman around 2018, um, he was recognizing the need to actually build their interests first. So he recognized that I came in with these really formal goals around their science engagement. And so he talked about how he learned that, you know what, um, sometimes I have to let them just play first. And so he talked about this time when the kids were making uh, 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 playing with snap circuits. And he said, you know, I wanted them to think about all the electricity and how the energy was being conducted, but they just wanted to play. And what I had to do was learn to let them play. And as they played, they began to get to some of those concepts that things were not working and I could help them to see how those things work. Um, so then that was Norman. Um, and when we think about the cases of Norman and Pastor Taylor kind of together and how their work, the two of the, their work in the community actually influenced each other directly and indirectly, it kind of brings up some ways that we can think about these community contexts being a, a, a really important for supporting um, asset-based community development dispositions. So in this work, um, in our analysis, we found that there are three important aspects of, um, of participants' dispositions that really came into play um, in the study. So first, there was a dispositions with respect to relationships, right? So their thoughts about how important relationships were in the community and how they they personally had um, either a whole lot of relationships in the community or not very many. Um, but second was in terms of their um, their dispositions with respect to science practices, right? From thinking that you know science is a regular part of my life to like Pastor Taylor, science is not my lane. And then there was their subscription to dominant narratives in, um, in, in STEM or just learning more general, right? Whether or not they thought that science needed to look the way that it looks in a formal classroom, that it's with people with lab coats and it's very formal and you know not very playful and things like that versus thinking that science could be relevant in everyday life and it could look really different than the way that we tend to think of it in formal settings. So we said that these in our study that these these three these three as, um, aspects of disposition um, came into play, and there were these ways that they were actually enacted by the adults, right? So there was the scientizing, which is when they actually began to take up those scientific dispositions, right, and use their own unique approaches to science engagement, such as Norman bringing in his um, his dragonflies and then thinking about how that could be adapted for the kids. 
Um, but then we also saw how they were communitizing, right, and taking their own unique approaches to community engagement. Um, and then we also saw how they were beginning to how they were using their own identities and dispositions and more broadly, um, you know, as they um, as they participated in the program. And then we we had the 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 science everywhere village socio technical system. And what that consisted of was the community. It was kind of like the community bulletin board, right? And what that the role that that played was that it actually helped people to come in and share science that was going on across the community to raise awareness of what was going on and then to negotiate how things that people didn't think could be science or STEM could actually be related to STEM and then helping people to find feasible ways that they could begin to um, engage to support learning. Um, and then there were the practices around the bulletin boards, right? So there were people posting and then there was sort of gathering around it, asking people questions about posts and things like that, um, that, that played a role. And then there was the general, more general place and neighborhood and community members, right? Like where people were, that was in essence, sort of the village. Um, and so when we had adults coming into this village, right? Um, we had that, you know, people came in with all different sort of orientations to science, to their relationships in the communities, to ways that they were thinking about dominant narratives of, of STEM. But when they came, when they began to come together and have these experiences and participate, what we saw was that all these aspects of their disposition became more closely tied together. And so what that meant was that when we saw these overlapping, um, the, the overlapping boxes actually represented their broadened perspectives of STEM. Like STEM doesn't just have to be this chemist in a lab coat doing, doing formal work. It could be kids outside playing in the stream. It could be how I engage with my children in my everyday life. And then we also saw that um, that the that in each area of these dispositions that our participants were actually um, facilitating, it was facilitating shifts in their individual aspects of their disposition as they engaged and negotiated what STEM could be with so many different um, adults in the community. So now then what I want to do is kind of leave you all with um, some questions to think about. Hopefully these stories have kind of spurred some thoughts or, um, uh, you know, ideas about what ways adults can play a role in community learning in your school districts. And so the questions I want to leave you with then are, how can you bring the village together to foster learning in your school communities? And what dispositions might we need to shift or change to really support these types of learning? And so with that, I would like to um, thank my collaborators on the Science Everywhere project, um, and I will um, see the floor back to Stephanie. All right, welcome back, everyone. I hope that you enjoyed your uh, discussions and your breakout rooms. Really appreciate all of the thoughtful conversation. Um, we have two questions I think we can close our session with, so I'm going to ask Dr. Plague to speak to these. So um, someone asks, should we view dispositions as broader than interests? Um, yeah, so I think we talked about this a little bit in our um, in our small group. Um, so I think um, I think though there are two interrelated concepts. Um, and so what we were saying was that I think interests are part of dispositions, right? So, so I guess in that sense, maybe yes. Um, so I think that um, a lot of times when we, so our dispositions are the ways that we think about a particular, um, you know, topic or, or sort of like a way that we enact that topic, right? Um, so I think about science dispositions. So, you know, it's, it's thinking about like um, what science is and how I apply it and engage it in my life. Um, and so I, so interest should be a part of that. I think a lot of times when we think about science dispositions, we don't include things like interest and we don't include things like relationships and we don't include things like personal meaning or culture and you know all of that. But I feel like all of those things need to be a part of it because they actually, I think when, when we, a lot of times when we think of science disposition for learning, we don't include those things. But when we actually think of our own dispositions and our own act, you know, experiences in science, right, um, then those things play very key and pivotal roles and they continue to do so. Um, but we oftentimes leave it out when we come to think about learning. So I think interest is definitely a part of disposition. Um, and But it, it's not the only part. Um, but yeah, so, so maybe it is broader than, just, than uh, interest. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Um, so with your research, is, have you had any research on um, addressing sustaining community partnerships? Because I know some of the discussion that we had in the rooms was about, it was a lot about how do you form them to begin with, but how do we sustain them? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, that's a great question, because I think that's something that we're, we're grappling with now. So Science Everywhere 
ran as a um, as an NSF funded project for seven years. Um, and so now we're still continuing to um, to work with Pastor Taylor. He now has a nonprofit for the community work that he does. And so we um, we're you know writing proposals for things that we can do with youth in the community. Um, the Metamorphosis is the um, the nonprofit, the name of the nonprofit, they actually partner with um, our students at our school at the at the university um, to to be a part of the capstone projects that the university does. So there's lots of ways that we have sort of branched off from science everywhere into sort of new um, into into new arenas. And so I I see that as being sort of um, I, you know, I, I think a lot of times we think about scaling up and we will say like, oh, we need a whole bunch of community partners and how can we do this in like so many different places? I think I think there's also a lot of power in, you know, sustaining um, partnerships, um, you know, over over time and in, in, in um, particular places as well. Um, but yeah, we do have to think more about like, how do you, how do you grow both angles, right? Like, how do we grow our set of partners, um, you know, in a community? And then how do we, um, how do we sustain that, um, that over time? And it's, I think it's dynamic, it's dynamic and fluid, but a lot of it um, relies on relationships. And so I think, uh, you know, for my job, right, in the partnerships and the work that I've done, a lot of that is um, sort of really um, prioritizing building those relationships with different, um, different partners, or whether it's schools or, you know, now I'm working with athletics um, at my university, but, or, you know, um, or, or working with the community organizations. Yeah, there was definitely a lot of conversation about the importance of relationship um, and the importance of relationship and, and even understanding what partnerships to pursue, mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, getting to know your students and what's important to them and, um, and that, that guiding the path that you take in pursuing and sustaining those, those partnerships. Um, I think we have time for one more question that came in, and I believe that this is in reference to um, the socio-technical space, I believe you called it. Uh, someone asked about how how to organize the interplay between posting publicly um, on some of those shared community spaces and more private small group conversation. Yeah, so and we, that was something we talked about in our group um, as well. So, um, so I, I think that that is it. Actually, was a key, it, um, you know, to to thinking about how do you, how do you propagate this community, the, you know, learning throughout the community. Um, a lot of what um, the way that the sort of practices happen would be that the kids would be engaging in these activities, maybe um, you know, in, at, in small groups in a, in a program or maybe at home with their parents and siblings or things like that. And someone would sort of don the role or take on the role of community photographer. And so they would be the person who would be kind of going around and like taking a picture, oh, what are you doing? And then they kind of you know write it up and post it for the, um, post it for the display. Whether that be, a, a, it could be sometimes it was the, the youth themselves and then sometimes it was um, you know other adults in the community um, but people sort of shared that that responsibility and so it was a um, it was both a sort of driver to help to have people reflect um, you know one of the things that we always that we've always talked about in my in, in my work from back from the days when uh, Janet and I were you know were working together at Georgia Tech um, we always a lot of times you engage in these really active um, activity-based experiences, and you can get so caught up in the experience that you don't do the reflection. But having that display and having the, the photographer, right, whether it's you or somebody coming around, it actually um, it actually facilitates and motivates that that reflection. And then having those posts publicly actually um, sort of make this um, community collage of what science is and what it can be, right? This broadened sort of picture of, of, of what it is that even if people weren't necessarily coming up to intending to come up and scroll through the display, just seeing it in passing, I think um, a lot of them told us in interviews that that actually influenced how they thought about science. Yeah, I think that's such an interesting component of this project and something that school leaders can definitely take back as a very practical, actionable thing that they can do. Yeah, yeah. So I can't thank you enough for being here with us today. Um, I want to share a couple of next steps for, for everyone who's on the call. Um, we're excited to let you know what's happening next. So the conversations that we've had here today um, and the questions that you generated are going to inform a blog that we're going to publish on the Digital Promise website that will also include a video of Dr. Clegg's presentation. And I mentioned uh, at the start that this is the first, or I'm sorry, this is the fourth in a five-part series of webinars that we've hosted, sponsored by the Wallace Foundation. And we have one remaining webinar, and we'd love to see you there. It's on November 10th. 
It's titled Learning, Relationships, and Power, Attending to Each Moment of Teaching as Pedagogical Possibility Toward Equity. And our guest speaker there is Dr. Thomas Phillips. We would love to see you there. Um, I believe Jasmine has also dropped a link to a quick survey in the chat. And so again, we just really appreciate you all being here today. We, we value your engagement. And Dr. Clegg, we can't thank you enough for sharing your expertise. Um, we hope you all have a fantastic day.